Chen from OpenAI to give us a talk. Uh, I don't know how many of you have already uh, used the ChatGPT. I know some, some of, of them are uh, really uh, kind, kind of attracted to the feature. Okay, uh, so, so let me talk about a little bit about Mark. Uh, so I know him actually when he was an uh, undergraduate student. Okay, so uh, uh, right now he's a research uh, scientist at OpenAI and also a, a team leader uh, in, the, uh, in the group uh, called the uh, multimodal, uh, multimodal something. Okay, so, so I, I'm also doing multimodal unity, but we are doing uh, uh, imaging technologies, so that's uh, different. Uh, yeah, so Mark, Mark joined uh, Open uh, pretty early, so I remember uh, when he joined Open uh, there, there were only maybe around 30, 50 uh, people over there, but right now they, they are pretty big, uh, several hundred, maybe uh, 500. Uh, employees already there. Yeah, so they are very successful, and if uh, you know the, uh, how popular the chat GPT is, then Mark made really significant contribution to, not only to uh, the uh, GPT part, but also to the, in general, uh, the artificial intelligence. Uh, just give you a, a bit of quantitative sense, uh, for all of his papers published, uh, the citation are, are quite big, quite highly cited. Uh, I can see all of them. Then one paper published in two years ago is cited uh, around 10,000 citations. Then another one is around maybe 2,000. Then you, you, you look at them, over the years, the citations will be, all of them are pretty big. Okay, anyway, so, uh, so Mark is going to give a talk about ChatGPT and beyond. So we are not software uh, <laughs> algorithm engineers, but we are uh, mainly biomedical engineers. So he will <laughs> kind of, you know, tell us a little bit the applications in uh, uh, biomedical engineering, maybe uh, biology. Okay, let's welcome Mark. Thank you for the, the very kind introduction. Um, yeah, so the title of my talk today is ChatGPT and Beyond. Uh, I'm Mark. I lead the multimodal and uh, frontiers research organizations at OpenAI. And if you've heard of the recent, you know, um, surge in interest in chatbots lately, there's been ChatGPT, there's been Bing Cat, there's been Barb. You might be wondering, hey, what's powering this technology? Um, why do we design these technologies? Why do we push up this? And uh, today I hope to just tell you a little bit about how these things are made, what their applications are, uh, and where these people are looking into the future. So chatbots, they fall under this uh, category called generative AI. Um, and you might have seen this not just as a phenomenon in text. You know, people are generating very realistic images, uh, sometimes even video these days. So what, what is generative AI? At its core, you're trying to give the system some data, and you want to train a model that can produce samples that look like they came from the data set, so that are kind of indistinguishable from the, the data that you've trained on. So how does it work? At its core, what, what you have is this probability distribution. You're trying to learn it by seeing examples from this data set. So I just want to give you a very, very simple example of what's going on here. So let's say I create some data set. You guys don't know what it is. Um, and it's some subset, you know, the numbers one to hundred, right? Like that it might be, you know, just all the prime numbers or all the numbers between one and ten. And what we do is we just pick a random element from the data set, and you, you see that there's the number sixteen. So you might wonder, hey, what else might be in this data set? You know, just just seeing this number sixteen, like uh, what what other numbers might you think are, are likely in the data? Thirty-two. Set? Yeah, maybe thirty-two, right? Because it's it, you know it's related to sixteen. You might think numbers related to sixteen. And if you survey a lot of people, you know, generally people are like, hey, maybe my rule is like, you know, I pick some numbers close to 16, or I pick some, some multiple to 16, right? And as you see more data, your picture of the probability distribution becomes more clear. So let's say I draft some more uh, samples from my data set. T1 
two to sixty four and eight. So are you more confident now that thirty two is the same? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it looks like you know we have a bunch of other of powers of two. And now if we survey people, uh, you see that you know people think you know all the powers of two are, are likely in there. You know maybe maybe ninety six is in there. You don't you don't know or you, there's no real way to tell. But this is also what a machine learning model does during training. So you're seeing a lot of data one by one. You don't see you know the full picture of things. Uh, but after as you see more data, you're getting a more clear picture you know of, of what's in the data set. And Basically, for every single number now between one and a hundred, we have some sense of like, is this likely in the data set or is it not? Right? And once you have this notion, um, then you can generate new samples. So I never saw four before, right? But I think four is really likely in the data set. So, you know, I if you ask me to generate a new sample, I might say four, uh, even though I've never seen it during training. And this is what generative models are doing. You're seeing a lot of, for instance, text, numbers, whatever. And you're trying to generate things that could have come. So this is a much harder problem for text now. You know, there's more than 170,000 words in the English language. So if you think about it, you know, in the space of all words, like what's the probability of the word talk, right? Um, how would you do that, right? You might go on the internet, read every single article you can, uh, count up all the times you see the word talk, and then all the times you know you see a different word, right? And you can just kind of divide those counts. Um, but that, work, that works for this, this example, but it's already very, very intensive, right? You have to go and read a bunch of articles. But how do you even solve something like this in the space of all sentences? Uh, what is the probability of this sentence? You know, what if Mark is not sure if people are doing this talk, right? Um, so you can imagine, like, even if you're looking at sentences with 10 words, you have like 170,000 to the 10, I mean, there's no way to enumerate you know, all the sentences. Um, it, it just won't even fit on your computer. So the real breakthrough that's powered the ability for models recently to generate text convincingly is called autoregressive modeling. And instead of modeling, you know, just this probability of all of this text together, what you're doing is you're generating one word at a time. You're trying to model the probability of the next word given all the previous words you've generated so far. So yeah, you again this decomposition is probability of the first word times probability of the second word given what you've generated before as the first word times you know, the probability of the third word given the first and second words, etc. So why does this make things simpler? It's because at every single point in time, you're now picking only just between 170,000 options. Right? Uh, you're not trying to pick between all the you know, combinations of different words. So generally speaking, what we mean when we say autoregressive language modeling is it predicts the next word given the previous word. Does that make sense to everyone? Are there any questions? That was pretty good. Okay, uh, let's keep going then. So there's been a lot of progress in autoregressive language modeling. And it's not, a very, it's not a very new idea. You know, dating back to the 1950s with uh, Shannon, uh, we have the popularization of these n-gram models. And these are kind of stupid models in, in retrospect. But there's just a big table of, you know, what's the next word given the two previous words. So you go and you know you go on the internet, you read all the text you can find, and you look at all consecutive strings of you know, three words, what three words kind of appear together. And you, you have you basically like uh, after let's say the two words a big, right? Like uh, look up might be one of the next words, or it could be table or something like that. So um, you compute these frequencies from real text, and now you can generate samples once you have this big table. The way you do that is you start with any two words, right? They also, and then what what might come after also, right? Like uh, there's a bunch of words that could come after. You sample one of them, let's say it's point, and then from that point on, you look at also point, and then what comes after. So that's uh, you, you sample another word, and you get a sample like this. You know, it, you, you could read like they also point to ninety nine point six billion dollars from two hundred four. So th this is a kind of nonsensical sample, but it's pretty good for you know ninety. And uh, what's one of the problems you might imagine with just using a simple system like this? Like, uh, what, what do you think could go wrong? Like, why, why, why might the samples not work? Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like um, you're only looking at the last two words, right? It's like when you're starting to generate the new sentence, you already forgot about the sentence before, right? You're not using that to determine the next word. Right? Exactly. Um, so going forward, we're building what are called these neural nets. It's not very important for this talk to understand exactly what these things do or what they mean. But you have these neural nets that are able to take into account uh, more information from, from earlier on. So yeah, you, you have slightly more coherent samples, like the meaning of life is the tradition of the ancient human reproduction. It is less favorable to the good of Yeah, it, it doesn't make that much sense, but at least there's some like hints of coherence here. And as we're moving you know, more, towards, uh, more towards the modern era of machine learning, we have LSTMs, which are even better at modeling long-term dependency. So this, this text here, uh, with even more new technologies coming onto the market quickly over the past few years, an increasing number of companies must tackle the ever-changing and ever-changing environment of machine learning from online. So you're getting more and more realistic text. Uh, it still has artifacts, right? It's the ever-changing mutated twice. Um, and at this point, you're starting to see the effects of scale as well. So the, the neural networks that people are training, um, even at 2016, are starting to be larger than the neural nets they train uh, a couple of years ago. 2018, you start to have you know, uh, transformer-based um, language models. And this is significant in that all of the models today are variants of this transformer architecture. And I can see, you know, uh, this is an example of a prompt and a completion. So you don't have to start from scratch every time you generate a sample. You can have the user write a, a couple things and then, um, and then have the model continue from there. And you can see, you know, like these starting to have coherence across paragraphs, but it still makes some spelling mistakes, um, it makes up some words here and there. And I think the big turning point, at least for me, uh, was when GPT-2 came out. Um, and I actually remember when this sample was generated too. Um, so in yellow, you're seeing the prompt. This is what a user types in into the computer. And they're asking the model, hey, can you generate some more text for me? So here the prompt is in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Valley. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. And uh, you can read the, the uh, completion. It's one of the first where, if you told me like, a human was writing this, like I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and you can see, you know, it makes up details, like uh, the researcher's name is Dr. Perez, and the appropriate given setting is in the Andes Valley. Um, and even going forward to GPT-3, um, the significance of this model is it's a much larger version of GPT-2. And what you're seeing here is a chart of the human ability to detect generated news articles, right? And on the y-axis here, you're seeing the accuracy. So how good are humans at distinguishing between fake and real news articles? 50% uh, is this line at the bottom. If, if a model hits that point, then it's really impossible to tell. And you can see as the models get bigger, the, the ability of humans to tell the difference really, really goes towards random. And uh, GPT-2, for instance, is roughly at this point, so it's, people still have a little bit of edge, but with GPT-3, you know, the, the error bars have already overlapped uh, just random choice. So there's so much progress now. It's like uh, the, the text that's generated, it can pass as human written text in many cases. It's not saying all cases, but in many cases. help us understand what's the number of parameters? Yeah, yeah, so over here, um, this one is about 200 billion parameters. Uh, what are the parameters? That, that yeah, so they're just kind of single floating point numbers. Um, and uh, you can imagine them as a lot of matrices, and, and there's different operations that, that you uh, carry out on them to, to get the next one's prediction. Uh, but yeah. Um, with GPT-2, it was you know somewhere in the like uh, one to ten billion parameter range, and for GPT-3, you're going to the hundred to a thousand billion parameter range. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, I, I don't understand my part, so okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so <laughs> I think it's worth at this point stepping back a little bit and reflecting. And why do we spend all of this money and 
an effort just to model the next word uh, in a sentence. Right? Like, does, does that even make sense to you? Um, doesn't that feel kind of silly? You know, like, what, what, what can you actually do that use with new systems? So I think this is a valid question. Why should we care about language modeling at all? You know, I, I would agree with you if you asked me that. And I think what we really do care about is not you know, predicting the next word, but really understanding language. And we care about performance on tasks that we care about. So like people, you know, they want their text translated, they want to summarize, you know. That's the real things that we care about. We want you know, the, the computer to read a passage and really understand what we want. Right? So in reality, GPT wasn't a system built to predict the next word. It was really a system that was an experiment towards solving one of the hardest problems in machine learning called unsupervised learning. And uh, this may be a new term for some of you guys, but uh, I'll give a very quick overview of, of what's going on here. So in traditional machine learning, uh, there's one particular type of setting which works well, and that's called supervising. And the way that works is you want to solve a problem, you go and collect a lot of examples of that problem, and then you have humans write down the real answer. So let's say like uh, you're, uh, you, know, you're, you get a bunch of healthcare records, right? And you want to get diagnoses for um, you know, these, these, kind of, um, these kind of symptoms, I want a diagnosis. So you can go to a bunch of doctors, they, they look at the symptoms, um, they, they produce the diagnosis. So you now have a bunch of data with labels. And you can train a machine learning system, let's say, that goes from the data that you see to the, to the label. And this is a setting that is tried and true in machine learning. If you have a bunch of labels for problems, um, you can create a system that's able to take you know, new symptoms and produce uh, a diagnosis for that. But the real challenge in machine learning is that the labels are really expensive, right? It takes a lot, it takes time, it, it costs money to go to, let's say, doctors and ask them to produce a diagnosis. And maybe there's a way we can learn from unlabeled data, right? There's a lot more unlabeled data. It's free, it's on, on the internet, right? Um, there's orders of magnitude more. But the scary thing is, now what do you train on? Like, you don't have any labels anymore. Um, so you have to find some way to train on this data that gives you some understanding uh, without, without really knowing the problem you want to solve. Okay? So why should we use next word prediction to solve this task? Well, uh, I'm going to give a couple hand-waving arguments here. But a long time ago, uh, the famous physicist Feynman said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And there's a very similar idea, which is the converse of it, which is if I can create something, then I also understand. And again, these things are, if, 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 so the idea here is if you can generate text to a degree that humans can't tell the difference, then this system must understand it somewhat. And let me give you an intuitive argument for why this is the case. So let's say you have some long novel, right? It's a mystery book, right? Um, you know, there's some people, there's like someone else, someone murdered someone, let's say. And in the last sentence of the book is, you know, like the killer was, and then there's a name, right? And to do really well at predicting that name, you have to understand in some sense, you know, like what went on in the story. Um, and you, yeah, you can't just kind of produce a random thing, right? So at, like uh, when you try to squeeze out all the performance of the next word prediction, you must have some understanding of what's going on. So at OpenAI, I think the first time that we saw this phenomenon emerge was in a work that's known as unsupervised uh, sentence interrupt. So what we did here was we took Amazon reviews, um, and we trained a system not to predict anything specific about the review, but just the next character uh, that comes in the review. So um, yeah, what, what we find is when we look into the model, uh, and I, this model is a neural net, so you can take one of the kind of, you can think of it as like a neuron, um, and you look at the values, and you find that even though we've only trained to predict the next character at any point, there's a neuron that emerges that understands the sentiment of the text that, that you're predicting. So it understands if this review is either a positive review or a negative review, right? And this is really impressive, really, really impressive to me, just because we're not training to understand, you know, like what the text is about. We're just training to predict the next character. But a neuron emerges that when the, the review is positive, it has a high positive value. When the review is negative, it has a high negative value. 
Okay. So some evidence that you know next word prediction is leading to understanding at a higher level. And going to GPT-2, it's the first example where we don't have to go in and look at individual neurons to see that the model is understanding. With GPT-2, uh, the insight was, you know, we can actually describe what we want as language, uh, and we can just ask the model directly. So let's say we have some long you know, passage like this, um, and we, we don't want to read it, um, we just want to ask the question, you know, did they climb into that? And then we can just put answer as a part of our prompt and ask the model to complete it. You know, we just ask for the answer and the model gives us the answer. And going on to GPT-3, uh, the cool thing now is that even new tasks that the model has never seen before, we can now describe to the model what we want by showing it examples of it completing this task. So you can see here, uh, this is a very weird task, right? The model probably hasn't ever seen it before. We're putting some you know, random garbage characters into the middle of the words. Uh, and we want the model to remove it. So again, this uh, yellow part is what we're feeding into the model. So we're showing it a couple of examples of the desired behavior. And even though the model doesn't see this during training, uh, the model is able to understand what we want through examples and then complete the, the last one appropriately. And we can see uh, this graph. You know, this is the number of examples that we're showing the user. Uh, the user is showing the model in, in context. And the more examples that we show, you see that the accuracy of the model on, on this task goes up a lot. Right? So with you know, 10 examples, the model is able to solve this task in about 60% of the time. And now people say, OK, um, sure, I can ask, ask you know, um, the model for, for some new tasks even, that, that's all fair. But these models can't even read, can't really reason. Right? I mean, they're just producing some local, you know, looking at local statistics, giving me the you know, next word prediction. Well, uh, just this year, um, there was a new result where someone just tried something very simple. Like, you want reasoning, just ask the model for reasoning. So, for instance, uh, one thing you might try is you might give the, the model some math problems, right? Like, this is a very standard, maybe like middle school math problem. So if you ask the model, um, this is like a, this question about taking care of dogs, um, the model is not super great at getting this right uh, very often. But instead, what we can do is, when we're prompting the model, we can give it an example of the model reasoning through um, all the steps that you need to solve the problem. So for this word problem, we show, hey, this is what it would look like if a human was reasoning about the problem. And now we give a new problem, and now like, oh, you want me to do reasoning? Okay, I'll do some reasoning for you. And it produces this reasoning trait. Um, and it, it gives you a, a correct answer for all. So again, uh, we're starting to be able to kind of treat these models as if they, they kind of like, in some sense, behave like what you can do. You know, you can ask for what you want. And going forward to this year as well, we just released GPT-4 at OpenAI. Uh, this was probably one of the just flagship uh, results. And we see that, you know, it's really seeing its understanding reflected in uh, some standardized tests. So, uh, whereas GPT-3, you know, on many of these standardized exams like SAT or GRE, um, perform maybe around closer to the 10th or 20th percentile. If you look at GPT-4, it's scoring roughly at what a 90th percentile. So moving on, um, we've talked about how we build these systems, uh, the capabilities that they have now. And the next section I'm going to talk a little bit about alignment. And by alignment, I mean how do you make these systems actually useful to the user? So let me give you an example of why we care about alignment. So let's say you say, explain the moon landing to a six-year-old in a few sentences. Uh, you might expect, hey, the model just gives you a good answer. But what you get in reality is not, uh, is not just a simple answer. You, you might get something like this. Uh, it might think, hey, uh, I'm in the middle of an internet article with a bunch of you know, different ideas for you know, like, uh, articles I could write for a six-year-old. So it might give you different examples. Like, hey, what about explain the theory of, uh, of relativity or gravity or the Big Bang theory to a six-year-old? But this is not what we want, right? Um, we, we just want it to say, hey, people went to the moon, they took some pictures, and they sent them back. Um, 
So how do we get the models to exhibit the behavior that we want? And the main technique that we use is something called reinforcement learning from human feedback. And again, this is a, a very kind of difficult concept in machine learning, but it doesn't take much to explain really what's going on. So it's a method that uses just a small amount of feedback to teach a model how to achieve a goal. And the way you can do this is, uh, I think it'll be very clear after you see this video. So we're trying to teach, uh, teach this uh, stick figure how to do a backflip, right? And every time the model tries two times to do it, and the human says, hey, um, I think the right side's better, or I think the left side is doing a better job of doing the backflip. So in the beginning, of course, it doesn't know what it's doing, right? Um, but every time it generates <laughs> two tries, and we say, hey, maybe the left side looks a little bit more like a backflip, or the right side does. Um, and over time, we see you know, that it's actually exhibiting more and more correct behavior. And it actually doesn't take too much feedback for it to do that. Um, so in, in the end, you can see that the, the stick figure, you know, it, it's learned how to do a backflip. And we never told it, hey, like, you know, a backflip means your, your legs have to you know, go over your head in, in a circular motion. But we just say, hey, which one's better? Um, and over time, the model internalizes this feedback and creates the behavior that we want. And it's actually very hard to specify what a backflip really means, right? So, you can start to see some uh, some connections towards how we, how we might want to align language. Right? Like uh, it's hard to specify exactly what we want, but maybe we can tell the model, you know, implicitly, like, hey, this you know, this behavior is better than that behavior. Um, so to run this at scale, um, just a, a quick detail is that um, it's very expensive to get humans to sit there and just click like left is better, right is better. Like um, it doesn't. Work at, at scale if we want to collect, you know, like maybe billions of labels uh, of, of, of feedback. So what we do is we first try to clone what a human would do uh, with the model. So we try to train a model that would exhibit the same preferences as a, as a human. This is just a small detail that uh, allows you to really scale this method. So how, how does RLHF work for language models? So what we do is we have our prompt, let's say like explain the moon landing to a six-year-old. And the model is generating a bunch of different tries, right? And just like before for the backflip, we have a human say, hey, look, I, I like this fourth one better than, than all the other ones. And then we try to clone what the human would do. So we train a model that would exhibit the same preferences as the human. And then we really just run this feedback loop at scale. So the model just generates stuff, we feed it to this clone, um, and then it gets feedback, and then we generate more things. And eventually, over time, the model becomes better and better at doing what humans and just for a quick illustration, um, if you have a, a GPT model, right, like uh, something that doesn't have a RLHF, and you ask people, hey, like on a scale of one to seven, did it do what I wanted to do? Uh, people give it between two and three out of seven. But after you do this procedure, people say, hey, it, it's five out of seven. It's doing what I want. And you can also use this to solve for more fuzzy goals, right? Like, uh, like you know, sometimes with these language models, we want them to be more truthful. We want them to be friendlier, you know, if you're using it as a customer assistant, for instance. Um, we, we want it to have less toxic outputs. And these things are all very fuzzy, right? It's like, tell me like what it means to be a friendlier response, right? It's like, you can't, it's hard to write a function. But we can have humans, you know, like uh, look at two different responses, say this one's friendlier, this one's less toxic. And over time, um, our models can become better at all. So what is ChatGPT? Well, ChatGPT, um, it's a GPT model that's first tuned so that it understands this format of human conversation. So it's like one person says something, one person provides a, a, a response, and there's many chunks of things. And um, we use kind of this RLHF thing that I just talked about uh, to make this system do what users really want. And uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll share a quick demo. So this is slightly less prepared just because um, we had some technical issues a little bit earlier on. Um, but yeah, let's give it a try. So uh, if you have never used ChatGPT before, um, this is what the interface looks like. Um, so you can type something, type a message into this box. So I might be able to say something like uh, write and abstract or AI talk uh, where every word begins with the letter A. Yeah, so um, this is what the assistant produces. So it says, 
saying the aspiring AI definition of this is simple. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's producing this abstract. Um, and again, this is kind of what, what, what I want, right? Um, and I'll show you a couple of other demos. Just, uh, or is there actually anything that someone would want me to type in? It's not really interesting. Oh, what's the <laughs> <Don't miss that. laughs> anyway, yeah, so it's trying to give you kind of this well rounded, you know, like, hey, you know, there's, there's religious answers, existential answers, humanistic viewpoints, et cetera. Um, yeah, so just, just to show you kind of uh, what these systems can do. Um, again, this is slightly less prepared than I would have liked uh, because most of the technical issues. But one thing is, you might uh, imagine that um, you, you want help with your taxes. Um, and um, here I'm showing kind of the, the API view, so this is a little bit different from, from the, the view that you, you just saw before, but um, I have the demo here. So let's say we, we have the model pretend like uh, it, it's a uh, tax GPT. Oh, geez, this is, uh, I don't know how this is. Um, yeah, so it's like, it's like okay. Yeah, so what, what I want this model to do is I want it to a helpful assistant that reads the tax code um, and spells out calculations. You know? um, and let's say I have this really, really complicated um, message. Let's say, so I, I paste this part of the US tax code, right? Like the US tax code is very, very hard to parse. Um, I give it you know, this, this entire uh, section over here. Um, and I want to, oops. So let me change up this demo a little bit. I want to use the stack here to determine uh, what, what the standard deduction is. Um, what the standard deduction um, has to be uh, in So uh, at the bottom, you know, I have um, I have this scenario. So you know, they, they get married, they have a son, there's there's all these other circumstances. And if I click submit, um, yeah, I think the standard deduction I've like worked out before is um, in 24, 24,000. Yeah, yeah. So the model is able to you know look at the tax code, um, calculate that the standard deduction is twenty four thousand, um, and you know determine the tax liability, for instance, and um, and yeah, you see you see this completion, for instance. So um, again, like these models at this scale, they're able to do you know or, or to take at a at a fairly high level. They can cope through all this complicated. Tax law and figure out what the uh, applicable uh, sections are, and really help you, you know, save a lot of work. Um, as another example, I'm, I'm going to keep this one maybe running in the, in the background for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think uh, just to show you the, the power of these, these things, um, I have the national one like turned on. Uh, let me just try to create the input strategy. So let's say you're a um, AI programming assistant. Uh, follows the user requirements and carefully reads the letter. Um, and let's just have it create a, a game. So, so create a single page web app game where the player navigates a canoe in a river to collect emoji gold coins. Um, and yeah, maybe let's change this up. You know, it's, it's a live demo. Do you, want, do you want me to change this game in any way? Um, yeah, we can collect something else instead of gold coins. <laughs> Yeah. Can I find you mascot? Okay, sure. Um, let's, um, what's, what's the best kind of emoji that's similar to? Uh, yeah. Is, is there a cat emoji? Okay. A cat emoji. Yeah. Let's collect. Yeah. Maybe something like a emoji. Okay, cool. And um, I'll just hit. And we'll, we'll let this uh, run run in the background for a little bit, um, and I'll, I'll keep going uh, going through my talk. But uh, eventually, we'll return to this, and we'll, we'll copy this into HTML and just see if it works. You know? 
but right now it's spilling out the plan for for what it wants to do. Um, yes, there's things like we said. You know, we talked about land. It's like kind of creating some of these emojis that I figured out a plan already. Anyway, we'll, we'll we'll get back to this. Um, so yeah, let me talk a little bit about GPT for biofluids. Um, and this isn't kind of my own work. I'm just talking about work I've done with my brother. But one, um, I'm kind of doing a literature review. This is one of the, the works that I, I found pretty interesting. So uh, this work tries to do controllable generation of protein sequences. And so you can imagine, instead of predicting the next word at every point, uh, the objective is to predict the next amino acid in the sequence of amino acids, right? And Again, the thing that powers these methods is data. So we are training this model on 280 million protein sequences. And from a database, you know, these, you can often extract the attributes. Like, uh, let's say there's 100,000 attributes. Um, and just like, you know, how we make prompts, right? Like the user can input a prompt. We put these attributes in a prompt, and then we have the model generate uh, a sequence that, so it, it kind of understands the attributes you want in the protein, and then it starts generating the sequence. So uh, how did these people uh, verify that, that this uh, method works? So one, one experiment they did was you, know, you have this kind of GFR uh, protein. You can remove the se sequence and its variants from the training data. And what you do is you, now that um, when, when you're sampling from the model, you give it all of the attributes of, of the GFR. Like uh, where, where does it, you know, what kind of animals does it, gen is it generally produced from? Where are the cells usually produced, for instance? Um, and you give it part of uh, the, the, the true EGFR sequence. So I think this is what's shown in gray. And you ask it to generate the rest of the structure, the rest of the of amino acids. And um, when they run this through kind of external you know, uh, 3D modeling tools, they find that what the model generates is a very low energy configuration. So what this suggests is that this protein you know, is like stable, it's uh, potentially viable. And um, it, it actually, resembles the true ground truth sequence. And even more so, like if you take the true ground truth sequence and you just you know, uh, corrupt a couple of amino acids uh, in the sequence, those configurations have much higher energy, suggesting that you know, what the model is generating is actually truly you know, like something that, that could be with um, and stable. Another experiment that they did was, uh, they, there's this database, a uh, separate database, of 150,000 variants of this uh, GP1 protein. And they have different levels of difference. Right? Some of these mutations may result in proteins which aren't very functional. Um, and what they do is they ask uh, Progen, uh, so remember, this is uh, a density estimating model. So for all of these sequences, you have like, is this likely or is this likely? Um, and you take the 100 most likely sequences uh, from, from these 150,000, and you find that what the model thinks is likely is also a highly fit protein. So it's a, it's a functional protein. And if you select random sequences, that those are actually uh, proteins with much lower levels of fitness, right? So the model is actually understood through next sequence, the next amino acid prediction, some notion of you know, like what a real protein should look like, and some notion of you know, viability or, or function. <coughs> And there's also kind of um, more recent work uh, applying this to electronic health records. So the idea is like you know you can um, feed in you know electronic health records and, and get, get diagnoses out. Um, the, I can share an example paper after this talk, but just to show you an example of you know like people using this in, in the field. So uh, someone tried uh, someone you know someone's dog got really sick um, after getting bit by a tick, and um, they turned to GPT-4 after kind of getting a couple of blood tests from vets and not really being able to find a real, uh, real problem with their dog. So what they did is they gave actual transcribed blood tests and results uh, from the vet and just fed it into, into the GPT system. Um, and again, GPT says, look, I'm not a vet, but I can try to help you maybe understand the blood work results and what might be happening with your dog. And then it gave a couple of new um, potential conditions that, that might be wrong. And, um, and then this person, you know, they went back to their vet, um, and it was a collaboration, they like, tested for, for this new condition. 
um, through some blood, and it confirms that you know this is something right. So, and you think you know in the future maybe we'll have these like really kind of collaborative like diagnostic kind of lines right, where people you know they're, they're trying to especially for the for long tail of rare diseases that you might be able to to consult you know GPT and it could actually interpret some of your symptoms and give you a sense for you know hey like what, what might I or someone else be experiencing. So they were able to you know uh, filter that. So yeah, before I go to the next section, let's see about this.
beneficial point. So yeah, with that, um, that, that concludes my talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Yeah, you use the word understanding a lot, and you gave this interesting example of a sentiment neuron. And I've seen other examples of a parentheses neuron, where right you open a parentheses yeah. and it's right. But that that doesn't intuitively get at the kind of understanding that many people people have when they're writing things, right? So you've got you get some unit in your network that's sort of mapping, as you said, the local probability of some part of your feature space. So what why why are you justified in saying that the network therefore understands the sentiment or understands yeah, yeah. I, I think it's always hard to get, like, everyone's notion of understanding is slightly different. Um, I think you could say, like, yeah, if it doesn't, like, reason perfectly, then it doesn't understand. Um, I think there's been a lot of work recently in terms of interpreted mode, and that's kind of, like, looking into this network structure and being like, hey, the way it's, you know, figuring out that, like, uh, there's a car in this picture, for instance, is, like, there's, like, oh, it's, like, a window detector plus a tire detector, and it has to be this, this configuration. Um, and I think there's a lot of progress with that for, for language models as well. I think ultimately the the language models will learn to do these tasks in a way that's probably different from the way humans would do. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the, the way the real way we ground it is through kind of these benchmarks where you know people see like, hey, like it, it's scoring this well on some tests, so maybe it has to. And and it's always going to be fuzzy around that. So I, I understand the point that, that you're making. Um, but yeah, it's. It's uh, no guarantees they'll think like they think it does. There's ways we can try to bake that into the model, but no guarantees. Hi, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions going more about the OpenAI charter that you talked about. Um, so one of the main things that you mentioned is building safe and beneficial AGI and making sure that this is open and accessible to everyone. In the latest report that came along with the release of GPT-4, OpenAI did announce that it was not publicly disclosing any information about how that data set was trained or the weight of the data, et cetera. How exactly does this fall in line with the open part of the company philosophy? And what measures were you taking to ensure that there could still be genuine public feedback along with those coming through private channels? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, one very important thing is like if you want to balance, you, you do need to balance openness with safety. And I think you're seeing this, especially with companies whose uh, kind of philosophy is towards like, let's open source everything. Um, actually, those companies are getting the most in trouble with respect to safety, right? Like people are using these models and tuning them to do uh, not so great things, right? Like to, to generate, you know, let's say like, um, like sexual content or, you know, for uh, sometimes, you know, about minors, for instance. So I think there's a, a lot of things that you get with API access, which is, um, yeah, like um, it, it's hard to enforce safety when you kind of dump a set of model weights and just kind of let people use it for, for whatever they want. Um, I think open often gets conflated with open source. Right? I think safe is is different from open source. And um, when you open source something, you really don't know the extent to which people are going to use it um, to do various various tasks. Um, I think one of our philosophies has been, you know, we, we open source a lot of models which we feel like, um, and, and over time we've open sourced um, like bigger and bigger models as, as their use cases have improved them. So for instance, when we launched GPT-2, um, we started out just launching a very small version of that, and over time uh, we've gradually released larger and larger versions. And I think that continues to be our policy going forward. As the use cases get vetted out, um, we're open to, you know, um, just allowing people I don't know if that fully answers your question. Unfortunately, I, I'd like to ask a follow-up, but first I want to see like, if there's others that want to ask questions. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that so are you a graduate student? Um, I'm an undergraduate studying computer okay. science. Okay, so during noon, you know, 12, 12 o'clock, we have a, a, a lunch meeting with the speaker. So you are welcome to join to ask more questions, you know. Oh, after the talk? Uh, after, it's 12 o'clock, after the talk, the 12 o'clock in the uh, meeting room. 
Yeah, so all students are welcome. So there's a lunch over there, so you can. Okay, you can ask whatever you want. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think um, people are really starting to explore the space there. Like, um, it turns out, you know, like, even with this kind of few shot copy, like, you show a couple of examples of, hey, like, it's, it should be faster from here in this scenario. Like, um, sometimes it's able to generalize. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting work being done there. Yeah, I think uh, for 3D modeling, we'll see a lot of progress. Is there any difference in the way that he was trained to like text versus how to code? Um, is it the same sort of stuff that you've outlined in, in terms of how it was trained to code? And like, did it have access to a compiler at any point in training? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, for these models, the answer is no. Like, uh, we kind of just treat code as if you were tech. Um, you actually can see that there's quite good positive trends. But like, the more you learn about text, it carries over to to knowing about code. I mean, it helps you train your code models actually much quicker if you kind of have that grounding in text. Um, and, and also vice versa. Um, there's, I think code is very special, right? You have like ground truth unit tests to determine the correctness of the program. Um, and, and there's some work I actually did in the past where kind of we, we leveraged that. And we can sub-select you know, code that, that runs, compiles, um, is high quality. And uh, getting to use this kind of nutrition step and, and interacting with the, the interpreter. Um, So um, yeah, when you look kind of at, at these model training, so we'll, part of it is building this very, very diverse set of benchmarks um, and that, that you track throughout, uh, throughout training. So some of these are, are targeted more towards like, does it you know, like, understand how to solve math problems? Is it good at question answering? Is it good at you know, like, uh, resolving like, pronouns? Or, like, there's just like a, a lot of different developments. And, and as an aggregate suite, uh, you're tracking you know, like, uh, what, what the performance is throughout training. So you can make sure you know, it's like, Really getting at what you care about. I think, um, yeah, actually, uh, this reminds me of a point towards kind of like open sourcing like the data sets uh, that, that uh, another person has asked about. Um, so, again, actually, a, a lot of the <coughs> um, kind of concerns about like our ability to fully open source data sets is limited just by the fact that we get a lot of our, our data from you know, partners that trust us with this data and don't want them, us to release it. So, they, we have to kind of agree, hey, like, here's a license to train on our data. But we really don't want it to be you know, just released in the public. So here we have a bunch of students and professors. So I think this is a pretty valid question. When Google or search engines were launched, learning and teaching was shady. When YouTube was launched, everything changed, right? So my question would be, how do you think and what would be the effect of open AI and GPT in learning and teaching? Because I know um, Many people have different opinions. Some say that this will make students dumb. Some th think that this can be an aiding tool, right? It, it, it can be used as a tool, not as a substitution. But how, in your personal opinion, how do you think this will shape uh, our learning and uh, teaching in universities, colleges, and schools? Yeah. So I mean, I, I do really subscribe to the fact that it is a helpful tool. And I've already used it to learn a lot of things. Um, just like, I, I'm not an expert even in, in, in bio, bioinformatics, like help me understand, you know, a lot of the, the papers and contents that you know, I, I kind of need like the six-year-old explanation of a lot of these things. Um, so it's been helpful for my own learning. Um, I do think, you know, like in, in classes, right, you have like the, like the exams where it's like, you can use a calculator or even like a, an open book kind of exam. And you also have the closed book exam, right? And I think they teach you different things. Right? Like one of, one of them is like, hey, can you like, Really, do you understand this? Can you carry this out yourself? And sometimes it's like, hey, can I interact with the tools and see, you know? And I think we might have to uh, have some system like that. You know, there's like ones where we can use GPT, ones where you know, we design problems around kind of you working with GPT to find, to find uh, some, some answer or, or lots of information. Yeah. Well, actually, I had a question regarding like accuracy. So, like, you model the research Correct answer. Yeah. Is there like ways that we can work towards to ensure that we don't accurate? 
yeah, yeah. So, um, like, sources of inaccuracy, there, there can be a lot, right? And at, at its core, like, a lot of it stems from, like, a lot of the information you see on the web is also not accurate. Um, and so the model will kind of reflect those same biases that, and kind of, uh, you know, fantasize or, you know, like, kind of create all these scenarios that, that are true. And so I, I, I've alluded to RLA justice, which is one of the best techniques that we have today. Um, I don't think it's perfect. Um, and yeah, well, there's a lot of active research right now. Which is, you know, like, can you can they, like, go into the model way to you know, try to get some sense for like, the model's understanding of truth, and, like what's truth for um, So again, it's not a solved problem. We, we know there's a lot of work to do there, but I think the best thing that works today is the model way. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a lot of work on yeah, crit critiquing and kind of like uh, debugging um, the, the model's own, own outputs. Um, it, it does tend to work, actually, that uh, you can um, produce some code, you know, ask the gate, hey, uh, can you just look this over, you know, like see if there's any, any errors? And this kind of iterative process actually does result in more, more accurate, um, like, for, for instance, like code, you can very clearly measure what accuracy is. Um, and this results in more work. So I have a question about reinforce, uh, yeah. reinforcement learning. Um, does that open the, um, the possibility to personalize ChatGPT? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, I think reinforcement learning is uh, one way to do it. But one, one thing you might have noticed is um, in, in the demos that I showed, uh, there's this kind of um, box over here of the system. And you know, when we think about you know, building AI for everyone, right? Like uh, you can see, like actually, a lot of the discourse when we publicly kind of release this, it wasn't something that we expected, but people were like, hey, is this like politically aligned with me, right? Like people, that's the, the thing people, you know, gravitate towards the, the fastest. And I think with like these system messages, we're basically telling the model like what personality and what kind of core beliefs that they should have. Um, and I think this is a way of really kind of helping people personalize the AI uh, to, to, you know, something that they, they feel like they are aligned. Um, so, in, in terms of customization, I think the system message will go a long way. Um, obviously, like there's probably higher level system messages which like yeah, you can't like make someone go suicidal or something like that. Um, but yeah, uh, this you know RLHF, there's there's some other tricks as well. Okay, uh, just well, obviously this is an incredible uh, talk, but I, I, I guess I also just wanted to to speak you know on a more pragmatic level, like what exactly is the um, potential limits of this, you know, AI, uh, 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 you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us here, we've seen, uh, you know, these movies and all this stuff, and it's like, we see, a, we, we see a more um, idealistic vision of what AI could potentially be, but I guess, you know, pragmatically, because this is the real world, you know, how, what are the potential limits of, I seem to have more experience, what are the potential limits of this um, artificial intelligence? Yeah, yeah, I, um, I think there's a lot, right? Like, uh, it's not this kind of like what you see in, like, in the movies, really. Um, and um, my, my, particular, my own research really is looking at the frontiers of what's missing in the current paradigm. And I think um, I, I focus on two broad themes. So one of them is just this ability to reason. Like, the, the models basically, uh, the way that they're set up is like every next word, it takes the same amount of time to generate, right? Um, and that doesn't really give the model a long time in situations where, where there is no reason for it, um, So just trying to attack this problem, like how can you allow the model to, to better think through things, you know, like spend a long time thinking about what's going on. And it's not good at that right now. Um, another thing is um, the, the space of, you know, like how do you both generate and ingest things that aren't text, so you know, like images, audio, video, um, that's still really under like the, the way humans perceive the world is through these other mediums too, right? Like uh, we're very visual people, like uh, you know, we hear a lot of sounds and um, our models, it, it's still kind of the wild west there. Like we, we're not sure, you know, what architectures really are the ones that work. Um, and you know, like how, how to combine them with our tech center or something. I guess with things like the, on the, the I believe it was the unsupervised yeah. learning, like that, doesn't that open the possibility to, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. Yeah, but I think the, the, the big challenge of uh, unsupervised learning videos is, is like um, there's just there's so many bits in, in, in video. Like uh, if you look at kind of like a text file or something, like, it's actually quite small. Like even even long text files, but even like a single video file, right? It's just like so many bits that you have to model, um, and that creates challenges uh, in the current. That's really, uh, so that's really, so you, you actually asked a pretty interesting question, okay, about the, yeah, you. <laughs> so I, I have a, a cartoon, actually, I, I'm looking at it. Okay, so in this picture, there are humans very busy looking at their cell phones. There, there are two machines that are busy with learning. Okay, so it says humans are hooked, and machines are learning, okay, so, so my advice is, you know, use your cell phone as less as possible. Okay, so I, I especially in the in the classroom. Okay, I saw so many people. Uh, the professors are, are talking, very busy, sweating, talking, but the students are, are busy with their cell phone. So, uh, so that's uh, something actually we, we really need to think about. It. Okay, so that's uh, one thing. Actually, I have a, a question. Uh, uh, so right now your 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 uh, your GPT has the ability to learn, right? So is it possible that GPT can regenerate itself? It means you have GPT three, GPT four, then GPT four generate itself to gen, uh, GPT five, then it will improve itself, but then ultimately it will so smart, <laughs> it will be dangerous as smart. Is it possible in the future? Well, um, I, I think one one kind of like practical thing that we think about is how do we build models that accelerate our own work process at, at work? You know, so like, are, are there models we can build that can you know help us code? I think that's why a lot of the, the interest in coding, for instance, are there models that can you know like uh, uh, help us collect data? Or um, and, and I think ultimately all all of these things will improve the feedback into the model and improve itself. There's actually some experiments going on, not at OpenAI, uh, but some. Of like uh, alignment and safety organizations that are recent that are trying actually you know like can GPT kind of interact with another copy of GPT to kind of like self improve um, but I don't think there's too many results. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, so there there will be a meeting, a lunch meeting with the speakers. So you're yeah, welcome to join and ask your questions. Okay, uh, then let's thank our speaker again. That's a wonderful talk.